Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome everyone to the final session of the 2023 Summer Institute. My name is Rosie Chater, and I'm standing on this very green lawn today, which is not my normal during the summer. I've just come off of Mount Desert Rock. Um, it's an island research station of the College of the Atlantic, and it really is just a rock. <laughs> um, <laughs> And today it is my utmost privilege to introduce a true hero of the ocean and a steward of our planet. Dr. Sylvia Earle is a pioneer of oceanic exploration whose love for the sea and all that lies underneath it has had a profound impact on how we perceive and also how we attempt to protect the ocean. Her interdisciplinary approaches through collaborative action have opened doors to begin tackling some of the most challenging issues facing our oceans today. Sylvia's work is not only inspiring, but it sinks so deeply into us that it touches something of the human condition, an unquenchable thirst for knowledge. Of the many different approaches to conservation, I think that the very first and most important is to teach and to learn. And in this way, Sylvia has truly inspired me. There is this deep, intangible human urge to know. We just have to know what's out there, what's on the other side, what's over that horizon. And there is a magic in the untouched and the unseen. And to get to that, to reach it, we must get as far away from the human world as much as possible. It is here that we can step back and reflect. This is where we begin to rethink the way we view our relationship with nature and the ocean. And I've always believed that to truly see something is first to learn and to understand it. And to understand is then to appreciate and to value. And only then can we truly learn to love. And to love is to protect. And with that, I'd like to introduce a teacher, an explorer, and my personal hero, Dr. Sylvia Earle. And joining her in discussion is the leading climate science author and journalist, Andy Revkin, whose work during the past three decades has chronicled the impact of climate change on our planet. So please welcome Dr. Sylvia Earle and Andrew Revkin. So have you had a good week? Yes. Class? <laughs> uh, it's like we've all been in class, uh, five days of immersion and uh, ideas and knowledge and information. Turning that into action is the, the big challenge. Um, and how much of that is about communication, education, more science, and the like is what we'll talk about. Um, it's just always a privilege to be with my good friend here from the other, the other coast and the under, the under part of the world, Sylvia Earle. Uh, um, I wanted to say when I first got here, my wife and I were coming into the tent. I think it was Monday or Tuesday, I can't remember. And there was Sylvia Earle um, with her hands cupped. Quickly, she, she saw me, she was like smiling, but she was like this, she had something in her hands and she was going outside the tent and it was a spider. That, was it in your hair? Is that what I heard? But it was Poor also, a, it was ecology, uh, you know, uh, right there. And what, right, what made you feel like you needed to get it out of the tent? <laughs> it wasn't very happy here. I think yeah. it needed to be outside where we, it wouldn't get squished. There you go. But that, you know, not everyone would have the same reaction to a, to a spider <laughs> in their hair. I think that says something about you. The other thing, uh, the, some of us who were speaking were out on the, uh, the Osprey uh, with Toby and the crew um, a couple of days ago. Beautiful day, you know, we're all there looking at the seals and at, at rock. And, and you spent, I think, two thirds of the time when we were around the rock taking pictures, looking straight down <laughs> at the seaweed going by the boat, which I thought said a lot about you as well. Uh, not to mention, I think it was 1966, you got your PhD in uh, seaweed botany you, you collected 22,000 samples or something in the Gulf of Mexico around the world actually Amazing. and most of them are residing at the Smithsonian in the and here and there as alas specimens I don't collect 
critters anymore. I did. Yeah. <laughs> Once upon a time. And then but you you went from. I, I collect photographs now. Yeah. Right. 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 But there's something about. Uh, you know, there was a point when I got a biology degree as an undergraduate, and there was a point when, probably junior year, when I realized I wasn't going to pursue a PhD because it was a lot of looking at the same thing for <laughs> eight years. And, and, and you did that. So you succeeded at that, and, but then you went global. You now, you took, you, you have this capacity to do that micro-focused science, and now here you are telling us about the importance of conserving the global ocean, singular. Isn't everybody? Well, <laughs> let's, we'll talk about everybody? that. We're going to see, uh, Sylvia is going to take us on a, a virtual tour, of partially through her, her journey, her personal journey, and stressing we're going to talk about overfishing and plastic and invasive species and the other challenges that the oceans face because in this period, some called the Anthropocene, Although one of, my friend, one of my friends calls it the Plasticine. Uh, my good friend, the, the marine conservationist Carl Safina, calls it the Obscene um, <laughs> in a story that I wrote. But I, I, before we get into that virtual journey, I brought a surprise because this morning, the plan was Sylvia was going to come. We live in Lemoyne, uh, we're just off the island here now. My wife and I moved here to Maine after 30 years in the Hudson Valley, and uh, I grew up in Rhode Island. And we were going to go, it was, it's a really low and a really high tide right now because of the moon and stuff. And we were going to go mucking around, so I brought you some seaweed. Oh, you know how to make a... You know, everything here is virtual. We figured we'd go <laughs> physical. And you we know, can talk about plastic, too. That's part of the issue. So you, here's my present to you. Oh, my gosh. You know the way to a girl's heart. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Is Andy Goldsworthy here? He was communing with seaweed in, in his films. So what do you think about when you see that seaweed? You, again, we were on the boat. You were, you were really focused. I think you ought to take, take it back home. Ah, good. <laughs> Turn her loose. <laughs> good. You know, I, d I have spent a lot of time bringing seaweeds back for close inspection. And I've been doing it for a very long time, so long that when... My brother's son, my grand, my nephew, he just associated seaweed with me. And once he was walking along the beach with his parents and a lot of seaweed there. And he says, it smells just like Aunt Sylvia. <laughs> <laughs> I take that as a compliment. <laughs> cool. We can leave it right here with the floral, okay. or the floral bouquet. Yeah. There we go. The, the marine floral bouquet. There we go. <laughs> And um, so let's talk, let's get into uh, some imagery that you've provided that I think oh, can yeah. take us we a little could, bit on the, dive uh, right in. the next part of our start? journey. Um, I don't know if they're up ready? on the screen. <laughs> the, uh, the one thing I think that's interesting right from the beginning about your career, even in the 1960s, you know, we think about technology today, you think about uh, the internet and microchips and all that stuff Moriba was talking about you know, in space that allows us to be a co global community. But there's also scuba gear, Jacques Cousteau and, and his partners and others. You, you were one of the first scientists who had to use scuba gear to do that PhD, if I get this right. Is that yeah, right? Well, in the 1950s, my first time to use scuba, we had two words of instruction, breathe naturally. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. And it kind of works. <laughs> but there's and a here lot you more. are diving in. So the, let's dive into the blueness. Right, let's go. And if you haven't tried it, don't deny yourself. My mother waited until she was 81, and she really got angry with me. Why didn't you get me in the ocean sooner? And I thought I had tried, and I didn't try hard enough. But all right, it's not too late, no matter <laughs> how many years you have, or if you really don't like getting wet all that much. Submarines are coming online. So many ways to transport oneself these days to get the view of critters that live in the sea up close and personal. My first time as a young budding scientist, 1966, 64 actually, I had a chance to get aboard a National Science Foundation expedition to the, to the Indian Ocean and 
it wasn't really noticed until everything was in place that I would be the only woman on board. But it was noticed right away by a reporter in Mombasa. The headline, Sylvia sails away with 70 men. <laughs> <laughs> Subtitle, but she expects no problems. <laughs> so Andy, if you had to sail away with 70 women, <laughs> would that be a problem? It wouldn't be a problem, no. But it, <laughs> you know, the what, what I noticed that there's a wonderful documentary uh, came out on Netflix almost 10 years ago. Is that possible? 2014, called Mission Blue, which is the name of your organization. And there's a scene in there from TV at the time of another one of her uh, underwater enterprises with women, where the announcer. It's hard to believe. It's it's like 1970. 1970, yeah. And he's he's like. You know, this is a, an, a, an, uh, this is a, a, a region of brawny men, and here are these women. <laughs> it was like, and this is like a newscast, and he's, I couldn't believe it. But you dealt with this over and over again. You need a time machine to go back and realize how far we've come in terms of, we haven't come far enough, right? <clears throat> but we're getting there. I mean, let's, uh, let's just keep going. I mean, the idea, it was, about the time that you saw that headline, that was when astronauts were going high in the sky for the first time. This photograph, 1968, that literally marked a change, a change of a lot of things, laws, attitudes, perspectives, knowledge, maybe even a shred of wisdom. And people wanted to go high in the sky. The person who took that Earth rise photo Bill Anders, he said that was a cool photo. I mean, that's an understatement. But he said this is his favorite photo of Earth, another picture that he took. He said the world is blue. That's the blue face, the Pacific Ocean. And all together, when you think about Earth is an ocean planet, but it isn't just rocks and water. It's life that makes Earth special. And, and for us to be able to see that, understand that, we could not until we had the ability, har our harnessing technology to get up in the sky and look back and <laughs> we have a choice. We could maybe go to Mars. <laughs> and I say, go for it. Anybody who wants to get off this planet. <laughs> we <laughs> <laughs> Andy, Not I speaking have my to anyone in particular, right? <laughs> I, ha I have my list. <laughs> and I, I'm all for exploring as far and as deep and as wide as we can. But the first priority right now is to get to know the blue one. And I, I don't begrudge a penny for what we're using to go and learn about the skies above and the universe beyond, but it would be nice to have equal pennies to <laughs> explore this part of the universe because this is our home and we're neglecting it. We take it for granted. I have a quick question to, in, in, to slip in here. You grew up in New Jersey. You ended up in Florida as a kid. Uh, I, I, I visited my grandparents in Florida as a kid and I loved going into the surf. And Did you have some moment when the, the vastness part of the ocean really struck you in your own journey from childhood through adulthood into professional life? Well, the ocean got my attention on the Jersey Shore when I was about three. I got knocked over by a wave. <laughs> and I submerged for the first time. And I've been submerging ever since. <laughs> I mean, at first it was a little scary yeah. and I couldn't catch my breath. And then I could and my toes touched bottom. But I think it was remarkable, my mother was watching, and instead of snatching me out of the ocean, as a, many mothers would have done, she saw the big smile on my face, I think, when I came up and let me go back in. You found your element. Yeah. <laughs> when I was about 14 on a beach in Florida, I was snorkeling with my US diver's mask that was my, the one bar mitzvah present that I still own. <laughs> It was, it was the one with like the side panels. And, and I, I was there mesmerized. I'm sure you've had this, there are many people here. 
I was, had my snorkel. I was just like in the surf, just not thinking about anything, watching my shadow on the sand. And then I noticed there was a second shadow next to my shadow. And it was as long as my shadow. <laughs> <laughs> and I turned to the side, and there was a four-foot barracuda <laughs> just right there with that big eye. And that has never left me, that, that moment. It probably hasn't left the barracuda either. No, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the idea of being weightless, of flying in space, it's irresistible, but you can really feel that way underwater. But there are things to see underwater. Here's that image that the all-girl team, as the National Geographic headline had back in 1971, it was the first article that I did. They put together a first article for National Geographic. And the, the project called Tektite 2, Tektite 1, Four guys stayed for two months in the Tektite underwater laboratory. Did not come up for air on the surface, stayed contained, submerged that whole time. And all of this was partly Navy, partly National Science Foundation, partly Smithsonian, but it was also NASA anticipating people living for prolonged periods in isolation in space and for Tektite 2, there were 10 teams of people, scientists. They wanted to see not just uh, you know, make work, but real work, people actually doing things underwater, and to see what the behavior would like, how we would get along. And it was really by chance, I suppose, that some of us who were not male <laughs> applied, and the head of the program who had to decide, shall there or shall there not be women, had, I think, a good marriage, and his daughters, and <laughs> got along with his wife. And his comment was, well, half the fish are female. I <laughs> guess we could put up with a few women. <laughs> but they didn't like the idea of men and women living together underwater. And I'll tell you, Andy, they actually said, there could be hanky-panky on the reef. <laughs> Anyway, <clears throat> could be hanky-panky Fish anywhere. do that, too. <laughs> <laughs> but we mastered the fine art of using rebreathers before there were astronauts using rebreathers to make walks in space. The same technology, rebreathe, a mix of oxygen, nitrogen, or whatever, and no pesky bubbles are formed, or very few. <clears throat> and inside, it's nice, warm, and dry. You're living under pressure in these underwater systems. There's a slight pressurization in the space station, too, but not a whole lot. The difference between the inside and outside of in, underwater, it's about two and a half atmospheres difference. So we really spent most of our time outside. And yes, Jill, <laughs> here it is, the first issue that I had a part of in <coughs> National Geographic, aside from being a subscriber for my whole life, I think. Um, but the little headline there is, where is it? <laughs> All girl team. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> but the, the beauty of being able to be underwater for an extended period of time. You know, when you go with scuba, you have a little passport. You can stay for, you know, maybe an hour sometimes a little bit more if you don't go too deep, but the deeper you go, the less time you have. So going down to as much as 50 meters, you might have five minutes, but you have to stop on the way back to allow some of the nitrogen to escape. So, but if you're saturated, living underwater, you stay at a depth range, and you have day and night as long as you like. We spread 10, 12 hours actually in the water. Came back in to eat and sleep and do whatever, but being out there with the fish, getting to know individuals. I think about Jane Goodall with 15 years, day and night, getting to know one species pretty well. And she continues to go back and people continue to learn about that one species. What do we know 
-hmm. about grouper. How long has anybody spent with a single fish or a single kind of fish? We know a lot about grouper that we didn't know 50 years ago. We know a lot about how they taste and how they can be prepared. You know, you can boil them and you can fry them. You can bake them. You can do a lot of things with them when you, you take them out of the ocean. But now we know grouper of several species have developed partnerships. One species has decided to team up with, an, with octopuses to go fishing together. Another species has been observed fishing with a moray eel. I mean, a grouper finds lunch, but he can't get to it. It's down in the reef. So you team up with a skinny, long colleague, an eel. <laughs> you go over and tell the eel, I don't know what the language is, but their emotions they go through. And the eel comes out and they go fishing together. I don't know how that happens, but <laughs> Christian, <laughs> I think you should <laughs> spend some time yeah. looking at grouper, <clears throat> the crows of the sea. <laughs> th th this point about um, sustained observation echoes what Keeley, the photographer, was saying about how he works with uh, indigenous communities and other communities. If you just parachute in to yeah. get the picture, get the story, it's, you don't see the nuance. And you don't see faces. And fish individual, faces. individual properties. Fish have right. behavior. Right. Fish feel pain. Sorry for those of you who might buy into the notion that they don't, but we don't know what a fish knows. Mm -hmm. There's a little book by that title causes you to stop and think. Every fish has its own DNA, so do you. I mean, that's one of the great miracles of life, that everything is connected. We have the same elements of flowers and seaweed, basic elements of life, but they're all arranged in a way that you're different. You're Andy, I'm Sylvia. I see every one of you, and I look at the fish and I think, who are you? <laughs> what is your DNA all about? And you know, where did you come from? How, how, what do you do at night? <laughs> what was it like to be uh, here, you know, maybe 60 pound fish? What it was like when you were just a tiny little critter that had emerged from an egg? So I've had a chance to live underwater now 10 times. More to come, maybe. <laughs> but it's just transformative. I mean, difference between driving through a national park and pausing to camp, or to take a walk, or to sit on a log and just watch what happens. And to do it again and again, to get to know that bird, that bear, that whatever. We've been doing it on the land for the history of humankind. We're just beginning to think about the ocean. We have technology now that gives us that edge. And, you know, instead of being afraid of technology, and some people do seem to push it away, I think we need to embrace all of the tools we can and use them as extensions of what we can, can do. <laughs> to listen. <Technology. laughs> and to be able to see what we otherwise couldn't. And take these images that were not possible to take when I was a kid. The digital photography that has transformed the ability to record and share information, just to be able to have this collective consciousness of things that we couldn't imagine that we could imagine not so long ago. So I am all in for um, extending whatever it is that we do like clicking the, yeah. the clicker so that... This was a particularly <laughs> deep moment. What? This was a particularly deep moment. Oh, yes, thinking deeply. Yeah. Um, moving from the 70s now, this was 79, the ability to go packaged inside of a little submarine that walks. It's one atmosphere, no pressure that you feel on the inside like astronauts up in the sky. They're protected from pressure, the lack of it underwater, get protected from the increased pressure. And again, my experience with National Geographic, being able to, it was my first book, 1980, to articulate what it was like to 
be out there, 1,250 feet down, warm and dry inside, and looking at all the creatures that were outside, had never seen anything <laughs> like this thing before. And to have the opportunity to think about what do we really know about the ocean. Again, that was a privilege to have a chance to write that book and communicate, uh, first of all, myself, finding out what others know, and then put it together with the power of the National Geographic to disseminate knowledge. And then fast forward again, 1998 was the beginning of my role as explorer in residence, the third explorer in that role at National Geographic. And with a gift that came from the Richard and Rhoda Goldman Foundation of $5 million to National Geographic and collaboration with NOAA, where I had served previously as the chief scientist, some of my buddies thought it was a really cool idea to work with NetGeo and the Goldman Foundation and put together a five-year program to look around the coastline of the United States in places that had some measure of protection, the almost but not quite equivalents of national parks, the Marine Sanctuary Program. And it was amazing. We had, we had scientists, we had teachers, we got kids who came and did projects, and we visited all around the coastline over that five-year period and had so many people get in that little submarine. So simple to drive that even a scientist can do it. <laughs> and I, and I'm living proof. And uh, you know, I, I, I found that ability to use technology productively to be irresistible and work with engineers to help design and use equipment such as this little deep rover and other systems are on the way, but it was such a privilege to be able to add that dimension, the dimension of depth, not just the surface. We're beginning to understand more and more about the surface of the ocean and climate, you know, it's ocean we now know because we can measure temperature across the globe and see how the water transports heat and how the chemistry of the planet is shaped by life in the ocean. Follow the carbon cycle. Where does it take you? Into the ocean. And, you know, you know. Yeah. Well, and there were the, uh, now there are the Argo buoys that are deployed, thousands of them, the buoys that go down, take temperature, salinity, and other readings, come back up to the surface, pop that data up to the internet. That's right. And, and we have a real-time view of the dynamics. Working for us. Right. <laughs> it's amazing. So about this time last year, um, I was in the Galapagos Islands. I hope if you haven't been there, you'll put it on your bucket list. <laughs> but in this case, again, powered by National Geographic and some other allies who helped support an expedition, we used a little submarine called the Deep Sea and were able to take a young explorer, Salome Bouglas, who's there looking very happy with seaweed. Ooh. <laughs> You know, you think of kelps growing in cold water, certainly they do here in Maine, but right on, the, right on the equator, the Galapagos straddles the equator. You have coral reefs up in the surface waters. You have surgeon fish and grouper and snapper and a lot of things that you expect in warm water, but in, even in a single dive, your toes can be in Antarctica because of the currents that sweep up along the coast of Chile and come in, in from the west and converge. Within a sunlit area, kelp grows. And Salome has made that the subject of her dissertation at the University of British Columbia. Now there is a happy Salome. <laughs> so the cycle, the cycle continues, another, <laughs> another young seaweed scientist. Yeah, and that's another great thing that National Geographic does is to get to really bring the young explorers along and sometimes <laughs> pair them up with some of us who've been around for a while <laughs> and, and to take the opportunity to dive in. This is the kelp forest that is below where divers can comfortably go. I mean, you can sort of tip down, tiptoe down to, you know, beyond 50 meters, but this is 
closer to 80 meters. It's just on the edge of where divers can go. With a submarine, you can sit there, you can cruise around, you can be in the forest underwater. We also had a chance to take the Minister of the Environment for Ecuador on a little, little trip into the sea. He is a diver, but he'd never been in a submarine before. He'd never been down to where sunlight gives way to darkness. <laughs> <laughs> and so for him, it was a, a, a little... <laughs> Uh, just a little <laughs> scary. <So> <laughs> but he's a good sport and got all the way down to where sunlight does give way to darkness, as you'll see here. The reason you can see light is because we had lights on the submarine and you can see that they're illuminating a creature. And you never know what you're going to find when you go under the ocean. You just don't know. Even when you're out there snorkeling, you never know who can, is can going to come by. Like a barracuda. Right over your head. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. This is, it didn't happen right now. Unbelievable. <laughs> He said it, it didn't happen like that. <laughs> oh, yes, it did. Well, it's so interesting because it's like the humans are in the aquarium. That's exactly right. This <laughs> is where we belong. <laughs> no, actually, we belong out in the big aquarium, which is known as the ocean. But that's the thing, to get people out there, down there, to feel that, that joy. I mean, I say, I keep saying, I love the machines. I love the technology. This... The company that my daughter and son-in-law operate built this machine. It goes down to 7,000 meters. It's been out to the clarion Clipperton zone, off and, uh, way out in the high seas, south of uh, Hawaii, west of California, in depths of, well, you know, 6,000 meters, 5,000, in the place where deep sea mining is currently targeted. You know, it's on the chopping block right now. But scientists, from the University of Hawaii and from elsewhere around the world. Duke University has had many projects just to go down and explore, to try to figure out who lives there, what is going on. More than 5,000 species, that most of them without names, are now recorded from this area that, that is in the crosshairs of industrial yes, exploitation the for the manganese nodules that carpet the, the sea floor the in some areas, including the clarion Clipperton zone. And as we sit here, just the, the liberators are beginning to leave Jamaica where the International Seabed Authority has been, been trying to figure out how do, we, how do we do this? Not should we do it so much, but how do we do it? That's the, dis that's the perverse thing about the International Seabed Authority. They're not asking the question, here is the deep sea where, you know, it's the biggest space that has yet to be explored on the planet, the depths of the ocean. We know that there are things down there that we can use. So we need to figure out a mechanism to, to govern who gets to go there, how within a certain framework of action that allegedly will try to show respect for the environment, but wouldn't it be a good idea to know who does live there? What does it mean? There is the perception that they're just rocks down there, but these are rocks that have formed over millions of years around something organic, like a shark's tooth. So you can hold one of these little nodules the size of a potato in your hand and be looking at more than a million years of history. What was the world like when they began to form around a shark's tooth? And because there are a few metals that we currently can use in batteries, that we can use for our greening technology, greening the, what we need to address climate change, one of your major focus of, of trying to figure out how do we get from where we are to a better place? to make the transition from fossil fuels 
to something that doesn't continue to pour methane and carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, but <laughs> is this the right way to go? And just in everything that I have, I say, we don't have to do this. There are batteries now being made that don't require nickel and cobalt. And we have so much that we've already mined out of the ocean and out of the land, mostly out of the land. Can't we mine what's been mined and go forward with a structure that we talk about the circular economy, can't we get with it? Why are we wasting what we've already taken? Can't we figure it out and, and not take the plunge into the deep sea and destroy these extraordinary creatures? This is a whole system of creatures, a, like a submerged coral reef below where Oh, we don't need the sound, please. <laughs> We're going to get in trouble if we use sound. <laughs> and it's not just these collections, like systems. It's individuals, like this chimera. It, it, they live in the deep sea. And we're presuming just to intrude ourselves for a few metals that we can use in the short term while we figure out what the library of life, that information that we'll lose if we, if we proceed with this highly destructive approach, I want to know, who are you? How do you live? <laughs> what can I learn from you as a living creature in the deep sea? I mean, it goes on and on, so many things. This castle-like, formation that is pretty close to where we are here. It's all sure, the North Atlantic, but it's in the chopping block too. It's in one of the leases that have been already assigned for mining. Or not, depending on what we, we, all of us, stand up and say, you know, go ahead. It's just the habit of humans to take from nature. If it looks valuable, if we can use it, well, why not? Or we can lose it, and we do have a choice. Uh, but if you don't know what's down there, and we don't know, <laughs> but how can you care if you don't know? We could, could at least pause long enough to figure it out. Maybe we'll in the end say it's worth the trade-off. But I think we need to know before we go. <laughs> I think this little That's guy very agrees tweetable, with this. everyone. <laughs> it's just, but we're mining the fish, too. It's yeah. not just the, the minerals. We're looking at the ocean right. as just as we have every other part of nature. What can we take from nature? How can we use nature? I, Carl Safina says, yeah, but we better not use it up. <laughs> it's that we cut the trees. We, we find trees useful when they're dead. We find fish useful when they're dead. We eat them or we turn them into products or fertilizer. This is a fishing operation for orange ruffy, creatures that can live older than anybody in this room, more than a century. And if we're not talking about catching dinner or a small for, um, fisherman who feeding their families, their communities. We're talking about industrial fishing. So. Andy, how do we relate fishing, industrial fishing, carbon in the ocean, to your favorite topic, which is <laughs> climate and climate change? I mean, climate is good, but climate change <laughs> that yeah. we're experiencing now, mm, maybe not so good. No, well, the oceans, uh, you, as everyone here knows, I'm sure, with this, these marine heat waves has become a headline, when that wasn't a headline when I was writing about global warming 30 years ago. Everyone understood that the oceans will be trapping the majority of the heat that's accumulating because of the gases in the air. But now we're seeing that expressed. Uh, of course, we're also coming out of an El Nino, uh, La Nina into an El Nino. How much of what's happening right now is a moment uh, as opposed to a, a new acceleration? Scientists are still scrambling. Those and scientists. Carbon. 
the carbon cycle. Well, the oceans are another. That's where a lot of carbon goes. And and, uh, and but and we're do we intervene? There is another question. You we're know, we're looking at carbon-based units, all living yeah, things, right, <laughs> including whales. Um, International Monetary Fund. You yeah. know the study where they did a calculation that the carbon in whales is worth on the order of a trillion dollars if you're just thinking of carbon and climate. I mean, there are other ways to look at whales. Um, I look at this little minky, for example, Amazing. and some people, some countries, notably Norway, Iceland, Japan, still look at minkies as pounds of meat and oil. The biggest brain on the planet is not ours. Sperm whales take <laughs> the, the, the prize for that, but I have witnessed turning sperm whales into products in Australia, the last whaling station before they closed down whaling. And now, think of it, there are more whales today than when I was a child, because we did come together. I think it, whether it's, whether we have to, enough people have to feel, as well as know, why nature matters, and put it together so that we take decisions as a culture, as a civilization, we, we stop killing whales. Not all countries have, not all people have, but enough of us have that whales are safer today, except for what we put into the ocean <laughs> and what we take out in terms of the squid and other things that whales need to eat. But generally speaking, we have stopped proactively killing them. We care about them. Could we do the same thing for sharks or barracuda? <laughs> well, yeah, I just uh, ran a webcast on the white sharks that are increasingly coming along the, the Cape, Cape Cod coast and a little bit up here. Uh, I have the shark Sharktivity app <laughs> on my phone <laughs> when I did this piece about this new uh, uh, documentary. And learning to live with predators particularly is a really interesting part of the human experience in the next few decades. Not just uh, mountain lions, sharks, alligators, Nature is coming back, and that creates interesting situations. Well, the power of the press, Benchley, Jaws, it transformed people and their attitude about sharks. What can we do to turn it in the other direction? Well, this new film by uh, Ivy Mirapol, uh, it's called After the Bite. It focuses on a terrible incident where a, a boogie boarder was bitten by a shark and fatally mm. and died. And, but her story, her film is not, the sharks are scary, they are, and it's about h how do we explore in an uncomfortable way how communities can learn to live with this dynamic in the system that isn't within our control you know, all the time. If I were a shark <laughs> and I saw a human being, I think I, I would be entitled if I, if I took a bite out of them. <laughs> They're mostly accidental. They're mostly exploratory I bites. I mean, think of how many bites sharks take out of us every year. A few. Yeah. How many bites do we take out of sharks? <laughs> yeah. Hundreds of millions of sharks have died. Unbelievable picture. <laughs> for their fins alone. And some think it's fun to kill sharks. The sport of killing sharks. I mean, they're allowed. I mean, not that I mm. recommend that they do it, but... When you think, uh, who's, who's the big predator here after all? Even the biggest fish in the sea, whale sharks, are not safe from us. Mm -hmm. And yet people are now, as with whales, they're starting to say there's more to a shark I mean, than, than just a pound of meat or, or right. fin or something. Palau is fully protected sharks because Crazy people such as I pay big bucks for the privilege of going to swim with the sharks. Yeah. I mean, the tourism factor is real. Right, 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 right. And there's the carbon factor. You know, mm -hmm. if, if, just think about it. If whales alive right now are worth at least a trillion dollars for carbon, what are sharks worth? What are tuna worth? Mm -hmm. What's the rest of life in the ocean that we take out of the ocean by the ton? Isn't that blue carbon? Isn't that what the phrase means? This is, this is an arena, yep. And the question is, how do you measure it in a reliable way? If 
monetizing things, it's tricky. It's, it's a solution that society grasps onto really quickly, but it comes with lots of questions that journalists should ask. <laughs> <laughs> we should all be asking, yeah. what is the, what's it going to be like in another 50 years, or even 10, by 2030? Bluefin tuna, their numbers since I was chief scientist at NOAA in the 90s, I mean, what's remarkable to me is there still are some bluefin tuna, something that is a evidence of the resilience of nature. But going back to where they were between the 70s and the 90s, like so many other species of fish that we take on an industrial scale are down to 10% of what they were. <laughs> when I started making a fuss at NOAA about <laughs> what are we trying to do, exterminate these creatures? They started calling me <coughs> the Sturgeon General. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there should be one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and of course there's the bycatch issue. You, you go out looking for this or that or the other thing and you catch everything and you only take what you want and you throw everything else back in. But there's the sturgeon, <laughs> one of your favorite fish. Yes, one of my favorite fish. It's not because of the caviar. Well, I will say that I have enjoyed caviar <laughs> before, but it's not a mainstay of my diet. <laughs> but this, Could you I, live I, without it? Um, at, the, at the New York Times, uh, one of my beats was the Hudson River, the fate of the river, the return of, of species, the loss of species, and the sturgeon. I think I wrote about it from the mid-90s right through till 2016, was becoming a possibility. This is a fish that like sharks, they take a long time to mature, they take a long time to reproduce, and if Be you- Older than your great-grandparents. Yeah. <laughs> so you'll see, I think if you click through here. Yeah, so here's, there's a New York Times story that I did not write, it's in the year uh, <laughs> 1927. You weren't quite here. <laughs> and this yeah. is when, in the, in the Hudson region, sturgeon were called Albany beef, because it was just this thing that was in every, uh, every bar, there was, there was sturgeon meat. And now, in, in 2016, I, I broke this story in, in National Geographic of a 14-foot sturgeon had been spotted on sonar in the Hudson River, uh, an annual survey done by scientists in the summer. And if you look at the screen or later, you'll see oh, sorry, go back. what that means. The, the average sturgeon were sort of seven feet. And this is a fish that was likely 75 years old, almost assuredly female, because they're the only ones to get that big. And I think they estimated it would have had about 750,000 eggs. So they're they're they can come back. They can, if, if the water is still suitable. <laughs> and yes. if, they have, if they have something to eat when they emerge. Yep. And if we don't take all the moms and dads. There we go. Anyway. And then here on, on the uh, Sloop Clearwater, and this is a little early, 2010, I was aboard when the education folks had put out a saying that they do for kids to learn, and they saw this is a baby Atlantic sturgeon. He's <laughs> so cute. So the Hudson, and that's me helping to release a tagged one in 2010. That's a male, small male, about uh, small 120 fish. pounds. <laughs> so again, these fish are there, they, they can come back if we leave them, them space. Yeah. It's kind of like more of us said something important about risks to the satellites, if we stop the problem, if we stop emitting, you know, creating a bigger mass of junk up there, then the problem go, can go away, or at least be constrained. If we stop killing fish at rates that are unsustainable, then they can come back. But we're also on the edge of losing many forever. And we ecosystems, not just the species, yeah, right? Exactly. So squid, these are the middlemen, along with krill and a lot of other things. <laughs> the big creatures like whales, like the big fish, and most mammals in the sea can't get to the plankton. Now some can, like the northern right whales and the southern right whales. They eat tiny little copepods. But it takes this whole chain of events. And squid, many species, maybe 300 or so, this is how most people see squid. Mmm, delicious. <laughs> but, but around the world, it's just a 
makes my hair stand on end thinking about what damage we are inflicting on the carbon cycle, the nutrient cycles in the sea because of the large scale industrial extraction of ocean wildlife. We don't think of it as wildlife, but it's the biggest wildlife trade on Earth. I don't worry as much about illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing as I do about the legal fishing. This is legal fishing for squid, but it happens for so many species out in the high seas and even within our coastal waters. We take so much more than the systems are able to replenish. I know we're looking for sustainability, but we're so far from achieving the right guidelines for behavior that we can actually make that happen. Krill in Antarctica, another example, the cornerstone of the whole Antarctic ecosystem. Who dines on krill? Just about everybody. What do they dine on? Phytoplankton. And who dines on them? The zooplankton, including the krill. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I mean, why would we even think of going all the way to Antarctica with a big carbon footprint mm. and a big cost, well, actually subsidized, in order to capture these little creatures that have been dining on phytoplankton and zooplankton, and then the little fish eat the, you know, what's there, and ultimately you get these big systems. This is a, <laughs> this is a carbon cycle in action. <laughs> this is where you see the sharks, you see the birds, you see tunas, you see medium-sized fish, and little, the only ones not having a good time are the little fish. <laughs> <laughs> And by, by the way, this is when you should start to be framing some questions in your in your yeah, mind because in there. a couple of minutes we're, we're going to speed up here a little bit. Boom, <laughs> because again, back to your overarching concern that should be in concern to all of us: what's happening concerning climate? What's happening in the Arctic, in the Antarctic? We're witnesses to this geological acceleration of time. Bad news for creatures such as polar bears and the creatures who really need ice in Antarctica. Look at how we are now losing what once was normal. <laughs> We're not going to see the extent of the kind of ice that I first witnessed when I went to Antarctica in 1990. The wildlife there, they're having problems. And it's not just about the melting of ice. Every sample that we took on an expedition in February of this year, in the water and in the air, had microplastics, nanoplastics. We were using microscopes. And I think about every breath you take now, every drop of water you drink, you have to think about what's in it that did not exist in nature, does not exist only because of us. And Adaptation, that's one answer, what yeah. we do. <laughs> but Andy, this is you. <laughs> yeah, in 1979, I, I, was on a, I was the first mate on a circumnavigating sailboat as a young person out of college, stumbled onto it in New Zealand. And in on Mount Adolphus Island, between Australia and New Guinea, we had stopped on an uninhabited beach and had this experience that I'm the one with the long hair and, uh, on your left end. But most of it is not plastic. It was fishing gear, right. Fishing gear, and it still is, like something on the order of 80% mm. of the trash in the ocean, the big trash, the large things, and ultimately breaking down into the micro and nanoplastics comes from the nets, the lines, and other gear. And what the heck is going on yeah, here? Yeah, this, this, uh, I recently interviewed Tom Jackson, who runs a small enterprise in eastern Indonesia, uh, working with villagers to collect and reprocess the usable plastic, and, and this was in uh, Sulawesi, you're looking at an irrigation channel that had been opened after six months. Of the, the rainy season happens, and then dry season, they have to let water into the fields, which of course ends up going to the sea, like everything, and this is all plastic, and it was all the accumulation from six months of runoff through town streets into our ecosystems and into the water. You speak of the circular economy. I mean, we do with batteries, 
the, the metals, at least, are essentially uh, immortal, that yeah. you can continue to take them out and use them over and over again. They don't degrade. Plastics are a bigger issue. Yes, yeah. bigger is a good word for what you're seeing there. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And, uh, oh, wait, go back, go back, there we are. Oh, um, explain this. Oh, uh, well, we want to talk, and this is, we're going to transition to your questions, about one of the key themes in this conference has been sort of the mix of inspiration, innovation, technology matters, mm -hmm. and thinking about new steps. You, what is exploration? It's taking something to a new stage or thinking outside the existing box. This is, I, I had a webcast I did a few years ago with an artist, Stacy Levy, who was inspired by one of the people who inspired uh, Andy Goldsworthy. He mentioned him the other day, Robert Smithson. Back in 1970, he built this structure going out into the Great Salt Lake called the uh, Spiral Jetty. It's made of, but it's made of rock. And her, Stacy Levy's doing floating spiral wetlands. They're manufactured, they're, they're, she creates a wetland out of living plants and a floating array. And it's drawing nutrients out of this over nutrified these, new, uh, these ponds that have too much stuff in them. So it's not that one is right or wrong, it's just an evolutionary process. So I hope, for me, one of the takeaways from this whole meeting has been sort of inspiration, innovation, and education, exposure for sure, and that's where your communication work. And yours. Well, you know, <laughs> I th we're biased, <laughs> but scale. it really matters. I just want to say one thing before we culminate because we're running short of time, and I, then we'll get some capping thoughts from you too. It's that the information environment is different than when we were young. That's when we had sure. National Geographic matters hugely, but National Geographic's Instagram account matters hugely too. And everyone through social media, the upside of social media is essentially a connectivity system. It's that you can have that consciousness. Somehow it requires both the visceral and the virtual can, can come together through that, that most primordial thing humans do, which is to say, hey, did you hear that? <laughs> so when you think of the, this week and what we can do going forward, uh, what comes to mind? Among other things, it's the convergence of art and taking something like right. an old fishing net and transmogrifying it <laughs> into something that takes it out of the ocean, first of all, and then turns it into something that is admired as and by the way say, that was, wait, that's a grandson of yours is that yeah, right? my grandson did that bravo one. <laughs> yeah here we go isn't this right it's saving the planet it's not just the ocean it takes Absolutely. everybody doing whatever he or she or all of us together can pull off and i just want to say about national geographic has been at this for a long time and presently with one of my explorer colleagues with Enrique sala and his project that is now making a difference across the globe with pristine seas. Many of you are probably involved with this effort to identify areas that we really must embrace with everything we've got and not allow them to degrade any further. It's really something that we should do on the land and the sea together. 30% of the land and sea by 2030, we've got to hurry. We have to speed up because the planet isn't waiting for us. We're seeing a, a time of unprecedented decline, but I say unprecedented opportunity. With Mission Blue, working with National Geographic as one of the key partners, we have more than 200 partners, mostly organizations, and with every place, champions that are helping to go to restore reefs from this era of climate change, to try to do what we can to give back with a network of 150 plus places that are really nominated by communities, by individuals, and to go from wherever they are to get to a better place. There's a place right offshore from where we are now, Cash's Ledge that is a hope spot where if we care enough to mobilize efforts, we can save this mountaintop 
it in a way is an extension of mountains on the land, but it just happens to be underwater, crowned with kelp. And at the same time, Andy, you observed this happening. Any, anyone who lives around here has seen this probably. This is two harvests right here in Lemoyne where I live. Uh, there's hay on land and that's rockweed being harvested in the coastal waters here at Except the very early stages of understanding the environmental consequences. You're using the word harvest. <coughs> mm -hmm. Who planted that kelp? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I mean, we have to rethink our relationship with nature. We just have to. Right. And especially, I think, to understand that the ocean has a different approach to ownership. Or who owns the fish? Who owns the kelp? Who owns the air? Who owns Antarctica? Who owns the high seas? We now have policies that, from a human standpoint, nations have jurisdiction out 200 miles, but half of the world, right. almost half of the world, is the global commons. Now, on the chopping block, with industrial fishing that is largely ungoverned, the deep sea mining that is right on the edge of, of happening or not, depending on what we do or what we fail to do. I look at this with sympathy, the idea, because it's what we've always done. We've always taken from nature. It's, we call it natural resources, as if it's all about us. And it, it is, in a way, because we're the ones who can either choose to protect or to consume. And we've done such a good job of consuming the natural world. But have we reached the point, do you think, Andy, that this global consciousness of care might be emerging? That maybe you see something like this and you think, that's yeah, really a good thing. We're, taking use, we're making use of seaweed. We're putting it to use. But wasn't it already generating oxygen? Mm. Capturing carbon, providing a home for creatures in the sea, holding the planet steady in its own special way. Yeah. What is use, anyway? Can we get to the kids to think those big questions, save the sharks, to be able to embrace them with affection instead of fear, to look at plankton and celebrate plankton on t-shirts and <laughs> in their everyday lives, yay for prochlorococcus, you know. Everybody should cheer it and care for turtles instead of just eating turtles. To understand who they are, what they are, to get out there and make a difference. It's happening. And also to do whatever you can to get to the, the big shots, the ones that are making the decisions on behalf of all of us, like the International Seabed Authority. There are actually only 36 people on a committee that has the authority to make decisions on behalf of 168, not all of the nations of the world, not the United States, since we have not yet ratified the law of the sea, so we're not really at the table. But we can get to the table of leaders. I mean, George W. Bush was not exactly known for his conservation ethic, but he did something wonderful by protecting the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, the, the Papahanaumokuakea Kea Marine Reserve, the biggest protected area on the planet at the time that then along came Barack Obama as president, used his mighty powers, quadrupled the size. Still, at that time, it represented a fraction of 1% of the ocean. I mean, right. we're still talking tiny places. And we have to scale up if we and the kids are going to make it on this uh, little blue miracle. Well, all I can say is, if we can have a fraction, each of us can have like a tiny percentage of your uh, combination of spirit and 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 uh, energy and creativity and endurance, then that global consciousness can be a real reality. But it's up to the audience to ask those questions and going forward. Thank you so much, <laughs> Sylvia Earle.
so I think they're roving mics and uh, wave your hands and we have hopefully we have enough time to fit in a decent number of questions. Yes, we do right over here. And we can't see and please anything. Please speak right into the mic. Thank you. I'm a fan. So I'm thrilled to be here tonight. Thank you so very much. Uh, what's very important to this community and many others um, is fish farming, pros and cons, farming oysters, kelp, and fish. What do each of you think? Quick take on that. It could take a whole <laughs> thing, but consider what we grow on the land, how long it has taken to choose a handful of plants, a handful of animals. Of the animals that we grow, they eat plants. They are herbivorous. Sunlight plants cow. Sunlight plants chickens, and so on through. It's taken a while to look around all of the many animals that we could eat that most of our calories come from about four kinds of plants, corn, rice, wheat, and soy. And the other 20% comes from all of the other plants that we grow, plus all of the animals that we grow, plus what we take from the wild, which is a small fraction of the whole amount. So wildlife accounts for a very small fraction of what we actually need to power even eight billion people. If we're going to continue to grow or even <laughs> maintain what we've got. The idea that we have to be more efficient and we should not be growing carnivores. Think salmon. I mean, you can do it as a luxury dining once in a while, but we take this many fish to, meet, to make this many fish. You grind them up as fish meal. Now they're adding soy and a few other things, but the whole idea in principle, why can't we learn from what works? The, 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 uh, because there's a, been a market for tuna, people were trying to raise tuna. Well, good luck with that to feed a lot of people. I mean, you can feed some at great cost. But if the question is aquaculture for money, then raise sturgeon for caviar. And some people are doing that. Raise, you know, uh, uh, salmon. It's a luxury market, no matter how you look at it. But if you want to feed people, the best chance we have is to look at agriculture and get it right. We know how to do it better than we're doing it now, including not wasting <laughs> what we've already grown and to think more strategically about the use of the land to get more and the water. We haven't really thought it through. And so I think there's smart aquaculture like growing the oil from plants that are now costing Antarctica krill by the ton and all the, the carbon footprint of going to Antarctica with ships from far, far away. We, the phytoplankton that make the oils, the omega oils, can be grown in culture on the land efficiently. Nobody has to go all the way to Antarctic, or Antarctica to get krill, or to go out offshore here to get menhaden. The fish, the krill, the other creatures do not make the oils the phytoplankton does. So why not go straight to the source, bypass the fish, bypass the krill? That is smart aquaculture. Right. And that's the role of innovation. Uh, that's, yeah. a, that's a key part of that. And the one thing I'll say is, uh, Transparency. It, the key thing is to me is transparency. Knowing the inputs, knowing the outputs, and knowing the options. Even with seabed mining, you know, it's Congo, recycling, ocean. Laying out that landscape for a particular metal and understanding inputs, impacts, including social as well as environmental, and going from there. Same thing with fish, uh, with uh, f aquaculture. And there are some wonderful examples. My students, when I was at Pace University, we did a documentary on a woman, American woman in, in Belize, who had worked out a way to raise shrimp with no antibiotics, and where the water, when you, you, you drain the shrimp, far, the shrimp pond to harvest the shrimp, but they drained it into the, the, second, the second pond, 
So the water never leaves the shrimp farm. It goes from, you drain the, sh the water into the other pond, you take the shrimp, and then you start it all of it over again. And the process was done without antibiotics. Huge challenges in all these areas when it comes to scale. Uh, shrimp, there's a viral, viruses are going around through the shrimp farming world. Uh, and none of this is easy. So a lot of experimentation, a lot of um, oversight, you know, inputs, outputs, in, and options. Hi, I'm Lindsay. I work at Allied Whale along with a lot of the other women in this row. Um, so I first wanted to thank you for everything you've done to inspire another generation of female marine biologists. Um, and the bigger question, we use whales to try to inspire change um, through people's actions with like adopt a whale programs and on the whale watch. Um, and I was wondering how you can advise on how better to create connect people to areas like Cash's Ledge, which are so inaccessible and where they don't see um, the clear connection that impacts they're making on land have um, with those ho hope spots and other places far offshore. I use the phrase, no child left dry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> get out there, get down there, and take the kids along, or kids take the grown-ups around you and you know, immerse yourself, ask questions, never stop, and ask, always ask why, but especially ask why not, when somebody tells you you, you can't, you shouldn't, you mustn't, don't, <laughs> or, you know, Andy, what's your advice? Well, I, I don't want to waste too much time. I, I, we could follow up, um, because let's get some more questions on the floor before we... Uh, before we uh, end. Back over here, Andy. Hi. Um, your worldview is so wonderfully unique, and you started out the program and ended with the image of the big blue miracle. And I think for most of us, if we stood in front of a world map, we would focus on the land and start thinking about that. And I'm wondering, with you, if standing in front of a world map, what do you start to focus on? and where does your mind go? Can I interrupt and tell a story about you related to this? Is that okay? Google. Was it 2009? You were, she was at a meeting, I think, in Spain with some people from Google, from what I recall, from my reporting. And they were on stage, and you were talking about Google Earth. And Sylvia Earle said to the Google top brass, where's the ocean? No, I said. <laughs> it's just a blank blue surface. There's Andy, nothing. I said you should call it Google Dirt. Google Dirt. <laughs> <laughs> and because of her, significantly, there's now a topography to that part of Google Earth. So thank you for that. I don't know if you want to say anything else, but I had to. That really was exactly what you do. You take us to that blue blank. I will echo what has been said here several times. The greatest era of exploration is just beginning. We're beginning to understand that the greatest discovery so far is the magnitude of our ignorance. We have the best chance we will ever have to go from consuming nature to respecting nature and ourselves and emerging at a time that is within our grasp. Either we'll get it now, or it's <laughs> certainly gonna get harder. But if, if ever, it's now, it's now. We're so lucky, all of you, to have that map in front of us and say, okay, what am I going to do? It's not what, or you, 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 what am I going to do? Everybody has power to do something, and nobody can do it alone. And that's part of the reason why this is the best time ever. If we take to heart what is now known and say, here it is. Yeah, we need a map <laughs> to go forward. But what's your map? What are you going to do? And you do this, you do that, somebody else together. It, it's possible. That's what keeps me going, that I know it's possible. Thank you. 
thank you. Maestro. Yes. This is. So far he gets the clicker. Ah. While he's going to the podium, I'm going to slip in one more thing. You have work to do because Walt, if Walter Monk is any example, he lived to the age of 102 as an ocean prober. So don't you, your 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 energy and, and zeal are just amazing, and I hope you're with us through a long period to come. So people ask, when are you going to retire? I say, why should I? <laughs> why would I? <laughs> why would anybody? <laughs> it means getting new tires. <clears throat> so that's a pretty perfect way to conclude the week, I'd say. And um, so thank you both, and thank you, everyone. And uh, I, I, we've done this, this is our seventh year, and each time we've, we've tried to, to wrap it up. And really, Sylvia and Andy pretty much covered my whole thing that I wanted to say, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna try it anyway. But first off, I wanted to thank Sean Keeley and his development team for making this work. And, and definitely, um, who you may not see as much, but Dan Daigle and our Buildings and Grounds team, who has made all of this possible. And I'm going to try and encapsulate the week in Dave Lederun style top 10 um, take homes. And they're curated by me, and I'll go quick because afterward we can go up, wander up the hill, and have uh, one last drink together. Um, but so I will start by saying that um, never underestimate the youth. Here, you remember Riley Hodge, uh, you remember Raheem earlier, and Rosie tonight. Never, never underestimate the youth, empower them. That's number 10. You don't have to clap for each one, but you can clap for it. <laughs> um, I What did I do? Okay, I had to include this, because this was um, more inspired by Tom Klepek's story earlier. Uh, in the AI discussion, he described holding hands with, with Sylvia and the importance of human-human connection. We love machines, yes, uh, but never, never forget the human connection. And I had my own with Sylvia. And although I wish I could make my head look less like a watermelon, I, I do really appreciate this. Um, number eight, um, Nirav. Remember Nirav? I, I keep coming back to connectedness. Uh, and connection and density of people and a convergence is, yes, what's inspiring uh, the, the, the growth and, and connectivity among viruses, but it's the same thing among ideas. I think we are living in a world of new ideas, which is absolutely wonderful. Um, number seven, I loved Jill's phrase the other day, yesterday, I can't believe it was last night, but um, you want to change the story, change the storyteller. And more of us certainly uh, encapsulated and embodied that, but so many of the National Geographic explorers and all of our residents really, really did that. So um, that was absolutely in incredible. Number six. Um, some theme about tools and portals definitely wove their way through everything, every, every night. And Sylvia talked about it so wonderfully in terms of our relationship with technology and the world around us. And whether we're talking about Lee Berger and that tool in hand that I just find to be an absolutely unbelievable image, or um, or a, a New Caledonian crow and a, and a twisted little piece of stick. How do we figure out our relationship with technology? 
Number five, we talked about the commons tonight, uh, beginning when in the British countryside or with, the space, or with space as a planet or whether it be Antarctica or whether it be the deepest ocean. How do we possibly manage our commons sustainably and equitably? The children, the children are awesome. I love the kids. <laughs> Sorry. Number four, I have to give a shout out to an alum who wanted to be here to see Sylvia so badly. Her name is Lisa Burton. She is, um, yes, <laughs> Lisa is stuck at Real Pizza down the street. She is a founder of Real Pizza, but we all know that um, I think Oppenheimer is playing. So, you know, um, but um, again, when we, we have to be rigorous and thoughtful about considering our, those unintended consequences of exploration, whether that be with AI, nuclear power, or going out into the planet um, like we saw in, um, on, in Sentinel Island. Number three, uh, again, there is such power in the collective experience. I think gone are the days are the great, you know, white hope individually, but we are together as a planet and coming together, there's something very, very special in the power of collective exploration. That will mean the world of difference for us. Two more to go. Um, pay attention, right? We saw it so many times. Um, just pay attention. There are discoveries and explorations hidden right under our nose, and even the most mundane thing, like a curbstone, can reveal something absolutely gorgeous, as in Andy Goldsworthy's sculpture here at the College of the Atlantic. And lastly, the number one reason, yes, we talked about elevating the community over the, uh, over the individual, and by all means, we need to do that. But amongst all of that commitment and work, don't, for don't forget to take care of the self, right? And sometimes you need to nap. Um, <laughs> and now, just, you remember this is Stan Robinson, and just so you know, um, this is not mean-spirited. Spirited. I actually texted Stan and I said, hey, I really want to throw up this picture. And he said, by all means, tell everyone I said hello and to take a nap. Uh, um, and also never, ever forget to laugh and smile. Never forget to laugh and smile. Thank you, everyone, for coming to the seventh annual College of the Atlantic Summer Institute, uh, collaboratively done with the National Geographic Society. Let's go celebrate.